cabalgando, cabalgando con río y valor, va cantando las tristes historias de una guerra que ya terminó. Mind War of Trouble, Chapter 2 After the initial failure of the Movimiento, as the Nationalists termed their rising, in large areas of the peninsula and in the fleet, the Nationalists soon improved their position by a rapid succession of victories, and when I arrived in Spain, were at the gates of Madrid. Indeed, when I left England, I wondered whether I should be in time to see any action before the war was over. Ever since the elections of February 1936, which established the Popular Front government, both the extreme right led by the army and the extreme left political parties had been preparing to seize power by force. The tension increased through the spring and early summer months. Some idea of what this meant is shown in the words of Don Salvador de Matarayaga, a liberal authority by no means well disposed to the nationalist cause. 160 churches totally destroyed, and 251 set on fire or otherwise attacked, 269 persons murdered, and 1,287 injured, 69 political premises destroyed, 113 general strikes, and 228 partial strikes, as well as many more other cases of other forms of violence. On June 16th, in the Cortes, the government was indicated for its leniency towards this crime and violence by Señor Gil Robles, leader of the right-wing Acción Católica, and by Señor Cavo Sotelo, leader of the monarchist Renovación Española. As Cavo Sotelo sat down after speaking the communist Dolores uh, Iborari, uh, La, Pasión Ara, uh, La Pasión Adria shouted, That is your last speech. At noon on July 12th, a certain Lieutenant Castillo of the Guardia de Asalto was murdered in the street, apparently by three fascists. In the early hours of the following morning, July 13th, Calvo Sotelo was taken from his bed by uniformed uh, Guardias de Asalto and murdered. The government took no action except to imprison the 90 men of Lieutenant Castillo's company. In the afternoon of July 17th, the garrison of Melilla in Spanish Morocco revolted. They were followed immediately by an entire legion of Morocco, consisting chiefly of the Spanish Foreign Legion and the Regulares or Moorish troops. The same afternoon, General Franco arrived in Morocco by air from the Canary Islands, where he had been governor and commander-in-chief. He put himself at the head of the rebels. The details of his flight had been arranged in London by a certain Major Hugh Pollard, one of those romantic Englishmen who specialize in other countries' revolutions. Pollard had taken an active part in the escape of Porfirio Diaz from Mexico in 1911, and in the revolution in Morocco in 1913 which deposed of the Sultan Abdul Aziz and placed Malay Hafid on the throne. Now on this particular operation he took an English pilot named Beeb and his own daughter, Diana, aged 18. The Nationalists started with the great advantage, and the most important of the fighting services, the army, was on their side. Its spearhead was the Army of Morocco, of which a brief description might be helpful. The Foreign Legion, or Tercio, was founded in the early 1920s by General Milan Astre with the help of some of the ablest officers of the Spanish army, including then General Franco. <clears throat> then Major Franco. Its inspiration derived from two sources, historically and romantically, from the tercios of the Duke of Alba in the 16th century, the corps of the Spanish infantry in the days when Spanish discipline was a byword in Europe, militarily and practically from the French Foreign Legion, whose methods were studied firsthand by Milan Astre and his assistants. But the Spanish Foreign Legion differed in one important aspect from the French. It was composed almost entirely of Spaniards, although prior to the Civil War it was the only unit of the Spanish army in which foreigners could enlist. Service was for a minimum of five years, and was confined to Spanish processions overseas. 
During the Civil War, its strength increased from six Banderas or battalions to 20. Even then, about 90% of the rank and file and nearly all the officers were Spaniards, the remainder being Portuguese, with a few French and some Germans and white Russians. The Regulares were Moorish troops, recruited by the Spanish government and officered by Spaniards. Although mercenaries, they could show great courage and devotion. They were skillful and dangerous fighters, especially in the attack. There were also the Mehala, the troops of uh, Jalifa, the viceroy in Spanish Morocco, the Sultan. They had leavening of Spanish officers and were useful in skirmishing and mountain warfare. Senor Madaragia states that, with few exceptions, every army officer who was free to do so joined the rebels. There were, however, exceptions. Some of them, among the senior ranks, altered vitally the course of the war. Moreover, in the peninsula, barracks at the time, they were only cadres of the regiments because the conscripts had already been dismissed. The officers of the Air Force were about equally divided in their sympathies, but because most of the aircraft were in territory that remained in Republican hands, the Republicans had control of the air, which they retained until early 1937. Unfortunately for the Nationalists, the Spanish Air Force was not strong enough to make this decision, to make this decisive a decisive factor. Much more serious for them was the failure of their rising in the fleet. The Navy would have gone over to the Nationalists in, this, in its entirety, but for the Communist cells which had been organized in many ships. In those ships the Communists, with their flair and training for leadership, persuaded the seamen to murder their officers and throw them into sea. The Nationalists were left with the old battleship Espana, the cruiser Almirante uh, Cer Cervera, two new cruisers Baleres and Canarias, uh, the Canaries, which were still under construction, the old cruiser Republica, the destroyer Velasco, and four gunboats. The difficulty was that all the ships were in the El uh, Feral in the northwest, except Republica in the gunboats, whereas the Republican fleet was based in uh, Cartagena, able to command the vital straits of the Gilbertrar and prevent this, the transport to Spain of the army of Morocco. The Republicans had the old battleship Jaime uh, Primero, the cruisers Libertad, Miguel uh, Cervantes, and Mendez Lunas, 16 destroyers and 12 submarines. Their difficulty was that the crews, having murdered their officers, were unable to sail or fight ships effectively until, later on, they were trained and officered by Russians. On land, both sides depended largely on volunteer paramilitary organizations. With the Nationalists, there were the traditional Roquetes, uh, or the Carlists, and the fascist Falange, the later founded by José Antonio Primo de Rivera, the son of the famous dictator. It is worth noting, uh, yeah, it is worth noting that the Falangists numbered less than 5,000 in all of Spain at the beginning of the war, and were then of very little importance. Their numbers were swelled by volunteers after July 18th. <clears throat> and they played an important part in the nationalist campaign in Andalusia and in the early days. Later, of course, they achieved overwhelming political power, but this was certainly not due to their fighting efficiency, which was regarded with most, with almost, with uh, derision by the various units of the army and by the, the Riquetes. The Riquete movement drew its main strength from the Basque provinces, especially from Navarre, although its name originates in Catalonia. It was a product of the 19th century, nominally the first Carlist War, 1833-1839, through 1839, was fought on the issue whether King Fernando uh, VII should be succeeded by his daughter Isabella or by his brother, the Infante Don, uh, Don Carlos. Spanish law permitted women to succeed to the throne. Salic law imported by the Bourbon dynasty in the early 18th century excluded them. Thus the Carlists, while claiming to uphold Spanish tradition, were ignoring it in this vital matter. Despite the inconsistency, they believed sincerely, and even fanatically, in their ideal, for which they gladly gave their lives. In reality, the war was a struggle between the liberales, supporters of Isabella who wished to centralize authority, reduce local rights, and destroy the political power of the church, and the Carlists, whose ideas are embodied 
sorry, whose ideals are embodied in the words of the famous song, Dios fueros patria y rey, God, our rights, our country, and our king. It was also a war between the large towns and the countryside, the latter especially in the Basque provinces. Old Castile and Catalonia were strongly Carlist in sympathy. It was a cruel war, ending in a victory for the Liberales in the disastrous reign of Queen Isabella. Nevertheless, the Carlist movement remained alive, almost a faith in itself. In spite of another defeat in the Second Carlist War, 1870 through, uh, 1876, it persisted in the Basque provinces and in isolated pockets of Catalonia and Old Castile. As a political faith, it still exists today. After 1936, after the 1936 elections and throughout the succeeding disorders, the, Requet the, the Requetes prepared for another war. In the towns and villages and among the wooded mountains of the Navarre and the Alvala, in country house and farmstead, in cottage and hovel, the red beret and the ancient rifle of a father or grandfather hung above the hearth in memory of one or other of the Carlist Wars. Obsolete as they were, the weapons were taken down and cleaned, ready for instant action. Within three weeks of the outbreak of the war, 30,000 raquetes railed to the General Mola in Pamplona. The women enlisted as uh, Margaritas, as nur nurses for all duties short of bearing arms. Only the very young and very old remained to do the work in the countryside. Once again, a Carlist song catches the spirit of those weeks. Calzame las alpar al alpargatas, dame la boina, dame el fusil, que voy a matar más rojos que flores tiene el mes de abril. Such was the shortage of troops that they had that these had to be thrown into battle at once, without training or discipline, without adequate arms or equipment, against the fortresses around Urun and San Sebastian. And over the Guada, Guada Adrama, passes of Somosierra and Alto de Leon towards Madrid, it was a glorious thing to die in the defense of la tradición and el ideal. And so they died, holding their lives cheaply and taking no care to protect themselves from the fire of the enemy. A company in the attack was led by the captain and the chaplain, one grasping his pistol and the other his missile, all in their sacred scarlet berets presenting a superb target. So perished in the few first months of the war the finest flower of Spain. Afterwards, the nationalist command, knowing their value, Knowing the value of their courage and enthusiasm, sent the Carlists some of their best officers in the army. The Republican paramilitary organizations were provided by the various workers' unions. Of these, the principal were the anarchist FIA, uh, the Fera Federación Anarquista Iberica, the anarcho syndicalist CNT, Confederación Nacional de Trabajo and the Trotskyist P.O.U.M., Patrido Obrero Unificación uh, Marquista. After the movimiento, one of the first actions in the Madrid government was to throw open the state arsenals and distribute arms to these popular militias. Less widely, they opened the prisons. These, as Señor de Madaraiga <laughs> points out, had been emptied months earlier of their political prisoners by an am amnesty of President Anzana, and so could disgorge only common criminals. The latter were immediately enrolled into the various militias, and were responsible for much of the violence and the horror that disgraced Republican Spain in the early months of the war. Women too enlisted in the militias and fought beside their menfolk, often with even greater courage and resolution. They were also employed as jailers to guard female political prisoners, several of whom told me that they suffered much worse treatment from the uh, Belicianos than from the men. Of the, pol uh, of the police forces of the Civil Guard were nearly all on the nationalist side, although in a few places, notab notably Barcelona, their, their sense of loyalty to an established government proved stronger than their national antipathy, antipathy to mob rule. The shock police and Carabarinos, on the other hand, joined the Republicans, whom they provided with much-needed nucleus of officers and NCOs. <clears throat> on July 18th, the Prime Minister of the Republic, 
Señor uh, Caceres Quiroga, Qui, Quiroga resigned. President Anzana replaced him shortly afterwards with Señor Garil and a ministry of his own friends. But this government, having formed, having armed the unions, found itself at their mercy. The various militias did as they pleased, terrorizing the population. On September 4, 1936, Señor Largo Caballero, the militant extreme left socialist, became prime minister. His foreign secretary was Señor Álvarez de Vallo, his finance minister, Dr. Negrin, both of them loyal agents of Moscow. The leader of the nationalist rising was to have been General Sanjuro. He was killed in an air crash on July 20th, taking off from Lisbon to fly to Spain. A governing junta was established in Burgos after General uh, Cabanelas, consisting of himself, General Franco, Mola, Cuiapo de la Una, and Varela, with two senior, other senior officers. In the early days of the war, La República uh, Honrada was a favorite slogan of the army whose leaders maintained that they were in revolt, not against the republic itself, but against the president and government of Madrid, who were leading the country towards anarchy and communism. Of the army officers I knew, either personally or by repute, scarcely any had Falangist sympathies. Some were Marxist, I mean, not Marxist, monarchists, but the more majority preferred to leave that sort of thing to the politicians and get on with winning the war. This also summarized the attitude of the Riquetes, whose political leadership in any case was inept. The Falangists, on the other hand, never lost sight of the main chance, and schemed throughout the war to infiltrate their people into key positions of the government. General Mola insisted on flying the flag of the Republic until his Riquete allies obliged him to change it for the old monarchist colors. It was only after this event that he became a legend as a Riquete general. Cabanelas, although a senior general, was no more than a figurehead. After the death of Sanjuro, the choice of leader rested between Mola and Franco. Although Mola seemed to have the better claim as Franco, who, for reasons still imperfectly known, was recognized as general, generalismo and chief of operations of the nationalist forces. That was on October 1st, 1936. He did not become the head of state until six months later. <clears throat> On July 19, 1936, the day after the revolt in Morocco, the movimiento exploded throughout the peninsula. The result was neither the immediate success the conspirators had expected, nor the fiasco that the first Republican broadcasts proclaimed. General Cabanelas took over Zaragoza. General Mola rose in uh, Pamplona with 400 soldiers, and General Cuiapo de la Ona, uh, Lano. Uh, captured Seville with 185 men, and a prodigal use of bluff. The Basque province, provinces of Navarre, part of Alava, and the whole of Old Castile and Leon, Galicia in the northwest, and the western region of Aragon went over to the nationalists. But in Madrid, the people's militias and shock police stormed Montana barracks, and after a bloody battle overwhelmed the nationalist garrison under General Fanjul. In Barcelona, the army commander sided with the Republicans, and with the help of civil guards and shock police, suppressed the military rising, whose leaders, Generals Goded and Boreal, were captured and shot. The Republicans held all of Catalonia, the eastern half of Aragon, and all of New Castile and Mancha, the whole Mediterranean seaboard from the French frontier to Gilbatrar, a large part of the province of Estremadura on the Portuguese frontier, and with all of Andalusia except uh, Cadiz, Jerez, Seville, Cordova, and a small pocket around Granada. In the Belisirix, uh Majorca went over to the nationalists, but Menorca, with the naval base of Mahon, remained in Republican hands. In the north, the remaining Basque provinces of Guipuzco, uh, Guipuzco, uh, Vizcaya and part of Al Alava joined the Republicans. Together with uh, Santander and Asturias, however, Oviedo, the capital of Asturias, was held for the nationalists by General Aranda, who withstood an intense siege until he was relieved in October 1937. <clears throat> Thus, although the movimiento had achieved considerable initial success, it had met with some serious reserves. Most important of these were the failures in Madrid and Barcelona, 
you know, the defeat and in the fleet with the loss and the loss of Catalonia in the two Basque provinces of Guipuzcoa and Vizcaya with their heavy industries and raw material. Apart from Andalusia, where the anarchist tradition was strong among the peasantry, it is reasonable to say that the agricultural districts were for the nationalists. The cities and industrial areas were for the republicans. Thus, Catalonia was lost to the nationalists. The Basque provinces would not have gone over to the rep republicans, but for the attitude of the Basque separatists, these being deeply religious Catholics, with no sympathy with the communist miners of Austrias, nor with the anti-clerical unions of Santander, nor even with the industrial workers of their own provinces, but in the belief that they could secure a more complete autonomy from the Madrid government than from the nationalists, they allied themselves with the former, and declared an independent Basque Republic under the presidency of Senor Agure. Agure. At the end of December 1936, <clears throat> A young Navarrese officer with whom I was serving said, For me, the saddest thing about this war is that not only a Spaniard fighting Spaniard, but Basque is fighting Basque. The loss of the fleet, and with its command, the Straits of Gilbachoir, might have proved fatal for the nationalists. But for the prompt action of General Franco in Morocco, using six Junkers, 52 transport, air, 52 transport aircraft, borrowed from for him from the Germans by a certain major uh, Aruas of the Spanish Air Force, he immediately ferried the troops across the Straits to Spain, took the Algaceras and La Linea, and pushed a column under Captain Castellón of the Foreign Legion up to Seville to secure General Cuiapo de Lanos, uh, Lanos hold on the city. By the end of July, after a naval action of the Straits in which the nationalist gunboat Dado, escorting a convoy of troops from Morocco, beat off a strong Republican squadron, the control of these waters had passed to the nationalists. Thereafter, their communications between Morocco and the peninsula were secure. Castellón wasted no time in Seville, but sent flying columns to the Tercio in Regulares, aided by Falange, uh, Falange auxiliaries. Through Andalusia, within a very short time, he had occupied the whole province, as far as Malaga, in the east, and the Portuguese border in the west. The latter, having succeeded, secured the Guadarrama passes of Somosierra and the Alto de Leon, and held them against the sporadic attacks of the undisciplined milicianos from Madrid, turned to attack Ruan and the San Sebastian. Their object was close to the French frontier isolating the Republican territories in the north and secure for themselves the railway link with France. Dolosa, the capital of Guipur, uh, Guipur that one's a hard one, fell on the August 15th, uh, Uran on the September 5th, and San Sebastian eight days later. After these successes, the northern front was stabilized, with most of Guipuzcao and Alava in the nationalist hands including the capitals of both provinces. <clears throat> After the capture of the Merida in Badajoz, the nationalists launched their attack on the Tagus Valley against Madrid. At first it seemed although nothing could stop it. Oropesa fell on August 29th, and Talavera on the 3rd September. The only opposition came from the milicianos, who fought with courage but without discipline or military training. They were, moreover, handicapped by a lack of unorganized command. Some units appointed their own commanding officers and took orders from them alone. In others, there were no officers, each man acting as he pleased. It was easy for the veterans of Terso and the Regulares to outflank them, shoot up their rear communications, and drive them back in disorder upon the next defended village. On September 22nd, the Nationalists reached Marqueda, where the road of Toledo to Toledo branches southward from the main road to Madrid. In the Alcazar, or the Citadel of Toledo, a small nationalist force was holding out, having withstood more than two months of unremitting siege. The defenders, who numbered about twenty, not twenty, uh, about a thousand men, regular officers, civil guard, cadets from the Toledo Military Academy, and volunteers, <clears throat> had won the admiration of the world by their heroic resistance against repeated attacks supported by the artillery and air bombardment, by mines and by ferocious reprisals against their own families. 
Now they were on point of collapse. Their ammunition and food was running out, their medical supplies long ago exhausted. The victorious nationalists at Marqueda were forced with the problem whether to continue their advance on Madrid, uh, the main military objective, and allow the garrison of Alcazar to be overwhelmed and massacred, or to divert their attention to the relief of Toledo. Considerations of prestige and military honor impelled them to the latter course. On September 29th, the f or on September 29th, the military honor impelled them. Oh my bad. On September 29th, the fifth bandera of the Tercio and a taber of regulares entered Toledo, fighting their way up to the steep ascent of the Puerta Vizagara to the Plaza de Z uh, Zocodover. The siege of Alcazar was over. Uh, Colonel Mas uh, Mascardo staggered from the ruins of his fortress to greet General Franco, saluted and delivered his report in a phrase now famous throughout Spain, uh, sin novedad en, la Alca en, en el Al Alcazar, nothing to report in the Alcazar. From Lieutenant Noel Fitzpatrick and Lieutenant William Nagle, two British officers serving with the 5th Bandera, I have learned something of that fr uh, frantic advance on Toledo in the final battle. It is not a pretty story. <clears throat> on the eve of their assault on the city of the Nationalists found the bodies of two of their airmen, shot down the day before, who had fallen alive into the hands of the Milicianos. They were mutilated beyond description. When the Nationalist troops attacked the next day, they took no prisoners. Fitzpatrick told me that the gutters by the street leading down to the Alcazar to the city gates were running with blood. The diversion to relieve Toledo cost the nationalists one vital week. Had they pressed on directly from Marqueda to Madrid, there is little doubt that they could have taken the city without difficulty. The Republican government, after announcing over the radio that Madrid would be defended to the last, fled to Valencia on November 7th, accompanied by the Soviet ambassador. But already foreign help had begun to arrive for the Republicans. French Potez aircraft, supplied by M. Pierre Cotte, and flown by the officers of the French Air Force, batteries of the French 75s and Russian tanks mounting 37 military, uh, millimeter guns. The Nationalist advance was slowed but not halted. On the 7th of November, their troops held the whole bend of the Man, uh, Manzares, and it is said that one tabber of the Regulares penetrated as far as Puerto de Sola. The next day, the entire attack was thrown back in confusion. The international brigades, volunteers from all over Europe, raised by the various communist parties and trained in southern France, had arrived. They were sent immediately into battle, and with all necessary support from the aircraft, artillery, and tanks. <clears throat> Within a few days, they had expelled the nationalists, whom they had numbered heavily. Across the Manzares, into the outer suburbs of Madrid, a prompt withdrawal saved the nationalists from envelopment and annihilation. Only in the university city were they able to maintain a precarious hold across the river in the capital itself. A hold which cost both sides innumerable, innumerable casualties in the next two years. During the succeeding weeks, the nationalists, as yet ignorant of the strength that opposed them, launched a series of futile attacks against the city. These cost them casualties that they could hardly spare from among their best troops, but gained them no appreciable advantage. In the effort, the front was already stabilized when I arrived in Burgos in the middle of November. <clears throat> Thus began the second phase of the Civil War, the phase of foreign intervention. To meet the threat of international brigades and increased French assistance to the Republicans, the Nationalists invoked the help of Italy and Germany. Both supplied arms and technicians, obsolescent tanks, aircrafts, and anti-aircraft and anti-tank artillery, together with skeleton crews whose tanks was to train Spaniards, whose task was to train Spaniards in the use of their weapons. They were gradually withdrawn as Spaniards became uh, as Spaniards became qualified to replace them. A very few squadrons of bombers, and with their fighter escorts, were flown by Germans throughout the war. Occasionally, the Germans would send some new weapon to train Spain. My bad. Occasionally, the Germans would send some new weapon to Spain for testing, after which it was withdrawn. <clears throat> the, 
the Italians supplied fighting troops, maintained at a constant strength of about two divisions, with all supporting arms, including tanks, artillery, and aircraft. They also provided officers for two mixed divisions, in which the rank and file were Spaniards, the senior officers Italians. It was not a happy arrangement. In addition, maintained a few squadrons of uh, uh, Savoyas in the uh, Balasarics to bomb the Republicans' Mediterranean ports. The war material they supplied was chiefly aircraft, flown by Spaniards as soon as they were trained, and small arms, especially automatic weapons. <clears throat> the, Re the Russians did for the Republicans roughly what the Germans did for the Nationalists. They supplied technicians and war material of all kinds. In return, they exacted a far greater measure of control over re Republican policy and strategy than the Germans were able to obtain from Franco. The price of Russian cooperation was Russian direction of the war and the complete domination by the Communist Party of all Republican political and military organizations. Thus, not for the last time, Russia showed her allies her interpretation of the word cooperation. End of chapter 2